welcome to the Pat Life Podcast. As always, I am Patrick, and with me again is I now consider a friend because of how kind you've been to me, the audience, and everybody who uh, is loving what you're putting out there in your time, in your energy, and uh, your passion for what you do. So with that, I give you Mr. Frank Chester. How are you, Frank? Oh, fine. Thank you very much for uh, allowing me to talk, give you uh, some ideas or whatever you need. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to it, and I'm glad that you are you have that uh, that passion because, as you know, with people who have these ideas, sometimes the passion gets lost, as we talked last time, because they lose that artistic side. They get too scientific. So I'm glad that we still have that. But last time when we spoke, we went a lot into the Chestahedron, um, a lot of good feedback, a lot of people really fascinated with what you brought to the table, um, really interested. I know you talked to my friend Rob not too long ago as well. Um, so he, he as well, you know, he's one of those very much like myself who just loves this information because it is not just, uh, what we call the gravy, getting the gravy of information, but you're also getting stuff that can actually benefit our own lives, uh, other people's lives is, et cetera. So I just want to, before we get into some of the questions that people brought to my attention, I would love to maybe just kind of recap on the chestahedron. Um, the, you know, kind of what it is, how it pertains to the heart, because I think that will help kind of get people who maybe didn't watch the full first episode, get a little idea of what we're talking about when the questions get brought to the table. Well, um, no, basically the, the Chetahedron is a seven sided form that I found was the, after 22 years of working on this, I found out that it was the left ventricle of the human heart. So that's where all the blood uh, the red blood is concentrated from the lungs and then it leaves and goes and nourishes the body. Okay, and the other side is the blue blood or uh, the right side. And the right side, uh, I haven't studied just a teeny bit, but my main um, research has been uh, on the main muscle, which is the left ventricle. And What's interesting about this is that I've found um, things about the heart that haven't been discovered before. And the reason I found that new and different than what's in the textbooks is because I have a seven-sided form and it's just been here. Just It just came in in 2000. And so that it's an asymmetrical shape. In other words, it's seven. Yeah. It's, um, it's not regular, okay? But what I found that what it basically is, it's an interval, it's an interval between two extremes. And that's basically what the heart is. And so um, the heart, I can talk about the heart in such a way that I can explain more about what it is because right now it's very popular to be an unpumper. Uh, there's, most people are pumpers. They believe that the heart is a pump. Now there's this new thing coming out, not that new, but um, at least in the last 50 years or so, that the heart is not a pump. Okay, and so which is it? What is it? And how, how does that help us to, to say it's one or the other? So I have studied that and um, I've come up with ideas that the geometry taught me. I didn't teach the geometry. The geometry taught me. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so what I'm presenting is not my subjective opinion. It's not based on some kind of fairy tale that I read or I'm going to read or anything like that. It's coming off the geometry that has a lawfulness about it that uh, can be backed up. Mm -hmm. And it can be backed up in science. Okay not just art, because it was found artistically, but that then the science was applied to it. So the problems is with science is you don't have people applying artisticness to it. They right. don't apply the art part and they don't know it. Uh, and I mean, what they wouldn't know, they don't know where to start, but right. that's my training. I have an artistic background. Awesome. And this is a great tee up because this is just going to give people a little bit more clarity uh, as we dive in. So that being said, let's dive into your specializing in understanding and learning and researching that left ventricle. 
what is it that we're finding in that left ventricle when we're dealing with that oxygenated blood? What are some of the things that you have come to understand or conclusions, as you said, through the uh, objective truth nature of this whole thing? Okay, so um, uh, basically the heart uh, sits in our body in such a way that the red blood runs through it um, every less than one second uh, throughout our entire life at a certain angle. That angle is a little bit more than 35 degrees. That's also what is known as root three. Now, root three is the foundation of, this, of the three-dimensional world. Root two is uh, basically thinking or thoughts, whereas root three, which is the angle that the heart sits in our body, okay, is about formative forces. So the heart is a three-dimensional form, okay, that is, is part of our three-dimensional experience here on Earth. Okay, not the brain. The brain is basic memories and thinking and thoughting. Okay, and that's based on, on an authority kind of thing. You know, that's polarity. Uh, this is right. This is wrong. This is right. This is wrong. This is right. The heart isn't connected to that struggle. That struggle is kind of the battle of ideas. The heart doesn't battle. Okay, the part the heart balances that battle. And what we have to do is to try to understand and work with the heart, not against it. And the way that you do that is to try to work with polarities, not get associated with one or the other. Mm -hmm. So the heart is the center of our feeling life, which is in the chest, okay? It's not the center of our thoughting life. Okay, that's the brain. And what's left for us to do is to take action. So there's the three parts. There's thinking or thoughting, there's feeling, and there's action. So the closest to the action is the heart, not the brain. So if you, if I take the a cue and I put a root three line that goes from corner to corner okay that is the way the blood runs through our heart less than one second the rest of our life it runs at this angle and that angle is formally forced that angle is balancing polarities it's not gaining a polarity and telling you this or that it's actually working with the polarity and here is the chestahedron. You can see that the chestahedron is at root three. Yep. Now that is amazing. The heart, I mean, this is, listen, this is a lawful presentation. This is in fantasy. The heart sits, okay, in the body at that angle. And that is absolutely amazing. And so, of course, you know, I mean, the, the, the cardiology uh, research centers, they know it's root they know it sits at 45 degrees, but they don't know that that's a three-dimensional form that sits at root three. So you also have to remember that I've never seen a real heart. I've never touched a real heart. I don't need to do that. My work is not working with the materialistic view. I don't need this um, real heart to understand what's going on. I just need to understand what the geometry is saying about the real heart mm -hmm. and then trying to listen to what the geometry is trying to tell me. That's kind of what's happened. That's a beautiful thing. And so for those who um, you know, are listening um, and or watching, they're going to probably, there's going to be a lot of questions. So let's sting with the left ventricle, um, you know, because I know I have people asking me about blood and people are asking about blood pressure and all these things. And we'll get to some of those here in a second. But what can we say, what can you tell us a little bit about, um, and you brought it up last time, but talking about how blood is entering into that left ventricle. Like what are some of the things that people need to know about our, the importance of blood in relationship, in the, uh, the relationship with the heart? I know you kind of brought up last time, but I think maybe we can dive into it a little bit more. Okay, that's interesting. I, you see, the, <clears throat> the heart is a very important organ, of course, 
because more blood runs in a, in a concentrated area in the heart than any other organ or any other place in the human being. Okay, <clears throat> so what's interesting about this is that the blood, okay, um, does not come from the mother. The blood comes from the placenta, and the placenta is all about that embryo, not the mother. So the blood is really the only thing that you can really say that's working in you that's yours. I mean, yours and nobody else's. All right. So the blood enters the embryo um, and it is, it is circulating in the embryo and it's also pulsating in the embryo. There's no heart. There's no heart for, for 13, 14 days. And then the heart comes in. Remember, the blood is pulsating and circulating at the same time. Okay. So then the, then the heart comes in and it, it, it connects with the blood. And then, of course, at the other extreme is when you die, um, the heart stops, but the blood keeps circulating without the heart. So the main thing here is that you must consider is how important the blood is because in the geometry, it shows that the blood is what created the form of the heart. The heart, okay, is helping the blood do what it needs to do. So in a way, the blood designed the heart. Yep. And that, that is so, so important to realize is because that has happened since man was and the women were here. So the heart's been with us the whole time, and so is the blood. And that hasn't changed. Yep. Okay. And so the heart is basically um, through its evolution to the human, uh, as once it got to the human heart, it's not changed. It's still at root three. Right. And this is what I think is fascinating because. As you were saying, and I and I definitely have done uh, through these conversations, it opens different people's minds to the bigger pictures and trying to connect these different pieces. And through our conversation, that is what I've been doing. So there's been a lot of revelations on my end because of these conversations. So I just wanted to bring something to your attention. Tell me what you think. If there's anything that might spark your interest, or I might be wrong, but you know, you brought that up, and that just was so mind blowing. So it, it put into my my field that okay well if, if the blood is kind of what is creating this vessel to do what it needs to do we know it's electric being that it has a pulse before you know any sort of organs have in, and uh different cells have fully formed in the embryo it's then going okay well we know then that the blood is the driving force hence why all across history and religious texts and and cultural texts there's always this talk about blood and the importance of blood and you know, the body and the blood. And it really dawned on me what we're seeing in the world today and just in time of knowing, oh my gosh, this, this, ha this has everything to do with what you're saying. So what am I getting at? Well, if we know that, that uh, the blood's entering in that left ventricle and it's allowing that heart to do what it does, well, then it's like, okay, well, then how does it get to the feet? What's happening at the feet? it's that blood needs to come right back up, right? But it's coming up de deoxygenated. But what's the problem? And is that we don't fully understand and people do now, but people really don't realize that those feet, when you walk appropriately, you're creating the natural vortex of the foot. So think about what the vortex in that foot, the way the foot, the sole of our foot is, is, is designed. If you're stepping through it appropriately, you're creating this constant vortex as you move through space and time, what is that vortex doing just like it does in the heart? It's pulsating that blood back up. Now, here's the thing. What happens when you're in a shoe? You're disconnected. You're insulating that electric charge from foot to through the soil. So you're losing charge. Think about how many people also have plantar fasciitis, bunions, um, issues, you know, sciaticas, um, torn ligaments, torn tendons in their hips and their feet and all this stuff. It's because they don't have a proper soul, a proper arc, which means they aren't getting charged in, in that proper vortex to send that blood right back up. So now here's what even gets more interesting. 
Same thing with your fingers and your wrists. When most people have lack of dexterity in their ring fingers and their pinky fingers. When I grip appropriately, what's happening? You see that little rotation that starts to occur. You create that vortex that's sending that same vortex up. This is why, and I've looked into the studies of when you lack grip strength, that's a direct correlation to poor health, specifically heart health. Well, why is that? Just like we need that blood, blood, that charge to pump out through the body, we need that charge to come right back. So this is through our conversations has opened my eyes to so many things to make that much more sense. And I can keep going. There, I've, I haven't, I've, got, I've gone deep dive since we last talked, but maybe if you want to kind of chime in here, if there's anything that caught your attention or you want to add anything. Well, the, the whole body, the whole body is, is based on a proportion. And that proportion is called the golden proportion. Yep. Okay. And that's one to 1.618. Yep. Okay. So that's a spiral. Yep. Okay. That's the same spiral you have in a seashell. Yep. All right. So what you're saying with the fingers and with the feet, okay, that's exactly how if you take the fingers and go through the bones and you go up to the elbow and you go to the shoulder, it's all spiraling. We mm -hmm. are based on a spiral. Okay. We're that that is what is called growth factor and that growth factor is also in the heart as the heart yeah. is based also on a spiral right uh, let me tell you something interesting to consider and why i do this is because i'm not here to to answer your questions or to solve all your problems i am here to ask questions that will help you think uh -huh. okay help you think and you cannot think with your brain because yep. the brain, all it does is memorize what I'm going to say. Yeah, of course. What becomes before memory? What comes before memory is feeling. All right, so that's the heart. So here's the deal. When uh, the blood goes through the capillaries at your feet, okay, and what you said about the spiral is so important because the, the movement of the hands and movement of the feet is the, is the movement of the will. And the movement of the will is the movement of action. So if you don't have the correct spiral going on in the hands and in the feet, okay, then you're limited. And so it's very important to get those spirals right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what you're saying is really important. That's a health-wise. And that, if you could get the feet and the hands moving right, that leads to a healthy heart. Yep. Okay, yep. that affects the blood. Yep. All right, so now here's what I want you to consider. Love the it. red blood has a pulse. You know, bump, 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 bump. It has a pulse. The blue blood that goes from your feet to back up to your lungs has no pulse. No pulse. No. No, don't. I, what, what is going on there? Another thing, another fact is, is that the blue blood that's going back to the lungs to be oxidated okay is not only there is no pulse but both of the valves at the right side of the atrium can be removed because of an accident or something happened to the valve that we don't understand and they have to be removed the blood still goes back to the lungs without valves mm. Now, how does it go without spiraling? And how does it get through all the way up there into the lungs without a pulse? Now, there is the question. Okay, there's the question. All right. Now, you have to remember that all blood, all the red blood, moved through uh, vortexes. Okay? Actually, the heart is a vortex. All right. Now, a vortex is based on suction. There's no such thing as a suction, I mean, a, a vortex or a tornado or whatever that is based on pressure. There's no pressure. Suction is the only thing that allows a vortex to form. So the heart is based on a vortex. So it's based on suction, not pressure. Mm -hmm. Know what I mean? So yeah, what yeah, is, no, how come we have blood pressure? Exactly. You know what I mean? There's there. What is that? 
Now, you have to remember that the red blood moves back and forth. It just doesn't go in a straight line. It moves right. back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And that movement causes pressure. You now, mean or pressure? Pressure. Oh, okay. Blood pressure. So it's the, that back and forth. Yes, because it's going back and forth. Now, mm -hmm. on the other side, the blue, if that's not a vortex. Hmm. It's not created by a vortex. Okay. It can be affected by a vortex and it can be helped by a vortex, mm -hmm. but it's basic, it's basic drive. Okay. It's basic form. Uh, it, it's a, uh, um, uh, it's not an artery. It's a vein and the vein isn't based on a vortex. Right. No, I mean, these are very, very interesting things to consider because what we're talking about is the movement of the blood and the movement of the blood is going through this heart. Oh my gosh. But the heart is not moving the blood. The blood is moving the heart. Yeah, of course. Now, oh my goodness. I mean, the, tell me that's okay. What, what does the pumper say about that? Or what does the, <laughs> the uh, right. non-pumper say about that? Do you see? This is what's happening. This is this non-pumper idea is a um, peripheral idea. It's an idea based on the outside of something. Right. Or the pump idea is based on the centric. It's based on the very center of matter, whereas the non-pumpers are based on the peripheral part of matter. Okay. So if you get stuck with being a non-pumper, then you're going to be more and prone to join groups or societies or individuals uh, that have the idea that are more um, expansive. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so more expansive views connect more with um, spiritual ideas. Right. Whereas the pumper, the pumper people, the, the non-pumper don't like the pumper people because they, they think the pumper people think that the heart is a machine. Okay, so the non-pumpers don't like that. So those people that are pumpers will be more connected with uh, more of a authority, uh, more more um, uh, uh, um, being led by others. Right. Uh, being more earthbound. You know what I mean? Right, right, right. So the heart, okay, the heart, which is it? Is it, is it, is it a pumper or is it a non-pumper? What is it? So you come to me with an idea and my ideas come from geometry, okay? Mm -hmm. It's neither one of those. That's both of them. That's what I'm gonna say, it's both. It has to be both, it always it's is. Both. And where, that, where are those two polarities, those two opposites, it's called the battle of ideas. The warring that we do with each other is the same thing as the pumpers and the non-pumpers. They are battling with each other, and that's not healthy for the heart. The heart is a, an interval. It's an interval organ. And the heart, what it does is it doesn't get stuck on one of the other sides. What it does is it moves back and forth, back and forth, and it never stays the same because things change. Mm -hmm. And that's what's happening in our blood. So our ideas change, the older we get, we get more, more rigid in our thinking, whereas we're young, we're more flexible. And what we're trying to do is to, to balance those two. So the older person needs to be more flexible and the younger person needs to be a little bit more grounded. Right. And in between these two is the heart. Interesting. That is interesting. So that being said, because and I, I love it, and this is where it helps me understand a little bit more and try to have more clarity and begin to ask more questions and do more diving in. So to stay on that, the veins here, if, okay, so if we're saying that the veins aren't necessarily creating this vortex, can you say then, based off of where they're located in the body in regards, in relationship to the arteries, they're a little bit more superficial. Let me ask you this human touch, the transfer of, of energy, does that then potentially play a role, even though it's not charged in the veins, but helping the passing of blood? Because this is something that I've thought of here, of knowing that the, the veins are more superficial relative to the arteries. Like we can see our veins, a lot of times you can see your veins pumping just 
right? If you get a good pump going, as they say, obviously you'll, you'll see it. But why is human touch so important, right? Like we know that we're dealing with, you know, toroidal fields, energetic fields with the heart and the bodies, but why is that touch so powerful? And knowing, again, if charge is, we're talking about electricity here, we're talking about the blood is, is creating, I mean, our uh, oxygenated blood is creating this vortex, is creating this charge. There's something very important about this transfer of energy, electricity, someone's vibes. And so my thought process was, is could it be that the reason why the human touch is so important or connecting with nature, even though, yes, it's maybe not a vortex in the veins per se, but it is really helping that the charge around you it's helping the vessel itself with that charge connecting again with the frequency vibration of somebody else or or nature to again help facilitate ultimately what needs to be done is that passing that the flow of blood through the body because that is what gives us life what gives us that for some people really that spark that that drive and for others that lack of charge uh we see it in people who their their mood there's not a proper blood flow so anyway, just an idea. Yeah, well, I, t I tell you, here's what you should try to do with that idea. <clears throat> okay, now you've, lose, you've said charge and you've also said electricity. Okay. Yeah. All right. There is the idea that there is a life force this life force, I studied when I was in my 20s. All right. This life force, there was a man who actually, oh, by the way, it's also called prana. It's also called chi. There's a lot of different names for it, but the same energy. Right. This energy, to me, is what's doing all of this. Okay. Now, there was a man who, who found a... a uh, and, uh, they found the life force and was able to photograph it, to magnify it, to make it stronger, to help heal certain things that the body was having trouble with. Um, and it, he named it Orgon. Mm -hmm. Now, Orgon was discovered by Wilhelm Reich. Wilhelm Reich has now become very popular, but 50 years ago, boy, he was put in jail and he died there. Um, because of this of this this study, okay. So to me, <clears throat> I think electricity and vibrations and frequencies they're fine and so forth. But the life force is the only thing that's really real, okay. Mm. That you can really say what's going on. And that life force, okay, when he photographed it and enlarged it so you could see how it moves, it moves in spirals. Right. So, <laughs> so um, okay. And if you look at you look at wavelengths of electricity, yeah. Uh, you tell me what you see or what you find, okay? And <clears throat> as there's the, you know, there's also the idea of gravity and non-gravity, and so there's there's studies with that that are all centered around the same idea. Um, of you know frequencies and so forth. That's fine. That's not my field. I don't know anything about that. Okay. The only thing I know is both the life force that was discovered and the geometry. So as far as you know, remember the blue blood only will have a pulse if it runs over a red blood cell, a red blood vein or artery. Okay, but there is none, but it's very quick. The the blood that exits the heart and the blood that enters the heart are at the same speed. They're all going at the same speed. Now, the, the heart is never empty of blood. It's always two thirds full and it empties one third every one less than one second. So it takes actually three pulses to get all the blood out of the heart for the new blood to be in. But that's not how it works. Remember, there's no break. The blood is just constantly, there's no air. Right. I don't know if that helps at all. No, it, do, it does. I mean, and this is what's great about it is it's taking my thoughts and my questions and my comments, and it's, it's helping bring it different 
points and, and ideas to my to my field and obviously the listeners because we're in a time like one of the questions I'll get here in a second, but we're in a time where people want to start to understand this, their own vessel a little bit more. They want to be able to explore it more, be their own scientist, be their own doctor, and just trying not to just get by in life and really trying to be like, how can I be on the path of healing? And what are some simple steps that I can take? Because, you know, what's important right now is, you know, for a lot of people, it's connecting with loved ones. It's, it's getting out in nature. It's getting sun. It's, it's doing everything you can to just feel like you're, you're in, you know, you're a part of this, this perfect creation rather than being like, man, being in the mindset where that we're greater than this, but yet I'm always in pain or I'm always having problems. You know, (laughs) people don't want that as much anymore. So it's these types of, uh, thoughts and ideas that really start to get people excited, like people reaching out to me saying, hey, man, I really love what you're saying with Frank. So many ideas that it came to my mind. It made me think about some things that I wasn't sure, or it made me start asking questions, or I decided to pay attention to these things more. And it's like, great, this is the point. This is what we're trying to do. So I love it. Yes, all this all about going out in nature and seeing beauty, okay, and experiencing these things, okay. <clears throat> The mind can only memorize those things. Right. It can say, oh, well, I remember that sunset was beautiful. And now I come back the next day. Well, it's not quite as beautiful as it was before. See, you've got memory mm-hmm. getting, is screwing everything up instead of seeing the beauty the second day as another beauty and a different, right. not, not separating these two days. It's yeah. actually the sunset is a sunset and whenever you look at it. Okay. Yeah. So the thing is, is that only can happen in the heart. That's yep. where that's taking place. It's not being taken place in the brain. It's yep. not in polarities. At the that's what the listen. The brain loves to be in polarities because it's two dimensional. It's yep. between two extremes, but the heart isn't. Okay, the heart is the balance between extremes. So what you're saying is so important for you guys to do is to get out and get this experience and realize how important it is and how vital it is and how beautiful it is and uh, how how it just is heart you know it just fills the heart with love okay mm-hmm. your brain's not going to get in love with anything okay right no it's it's so true and and this is what makes it even so much more fascinating and what you brought up just right now is like you said looking at sunsets it's about looking um not looking at it as being like oh man Yesterday was so much better, or this and that, but it's finding, it is just knowing that, hey, I'm experiencing the sunset. I'm experiencing this beauty. You know, at being in Hawaii, we see all these rolling hills, and every single time, and I do this with sunsets, but that's a no brainer for a lot of people. But when we drive into our valley, like I like to look at the valley and see what is it that I'm noticing that's different. And it's not necessarily being like, I have to find something different. It's like, what's catching my eyes? What's catching my attention? And when I'm doing that, not looking at it being like, Oh, it's this or this. It's just going, why? Like, what is this moving through me? Like, why does that look so beautiful? Wow, the sun's hitting in such a beautiful way today. Wow, that looks so lush in that back corner today. Wow, the way the fog's covering the whole thing, it looks mysterious. That's exciting. Like, and that's for me, this is just me because I have, as we talked last time, I, I'm very fortunate to have such a background in the arts world and creating and trying to be always in that mindset of how do I bring that to life in my own stories? But through that, I'm constantly having to experience that. So I can not just put it on words or put it in video, but people can actually feel what it is that I'm, I'm getting across because I've, I've, I've lived it. You know what I mean? It's everything you're saying, essentially. Well, what you're describing, uh, what you're seeing is really an observation. Okay. You're observing something. Okay. You're seeing an image. Okay. So... I don't know if you know this or not, but that image, that observation you're doing is what's known as today consciousness. <laughs> and everybody's everybody's into consciousness now. Yep. Okay, you just described it. Yeah. So let me ask you this. Staying on consciousness, why do you think there's such a big flux of consciousness in people's fields? Why is it now all of a sudden become such a hot topic for people from your point of view? Well, I think I think that first off, it's coming from young people. Mm-hmm. Okay, they're not coming from people my age. I'm not talking about consciousness, unless it becomes a vogue, more of a vogue for those older people. Right. But you guys, I think, 
the young people, okay, are realizing that what was considered thinking and thoughting in the past, okay, isn't really working. Yeah. And so uh, you're looking for some a new consciousness that's there. The conscious, that new consciousness is there. All you have to do is observe it and get involved in it in such a way that you don't put it into memory. Mm -hmm. See, memory is really in the past, isn't it? You know, it's like imitating. Right. And when you imitate, okay, it means that you're copying the past. This is ridiculous. You don't need to do this imitating after 12 years old. You need to stop it. Yep. and at least go into innovation so hopefully that will lead to some kind of insight where you won't do the imitation and you won't do the <clears throat> innovation you'll be able to come back to that point when you need it but not to direct your whole life based on your memory of what was in the past and what you did in the past and that's good enough and now i can relax and i don't need to do anything else mm -hmm. or i got my degree that's all me where's my job <laughs> yeah, totally. But here's what's so cool about what you're just saying. It just took it a step further for me. I'm always talking about being in the present moment and trying to understand how we can work with that, get to that place. And as you just said here, what is cool to, to break down is the past is a memory, which is a thought. The future is an idea, which is also a thought in many ways. But what, it's not. Well, it's an idea. Okay. It's an idea, but what's interesting about the present is what is it? You're not think a lot of people when you're in that flow state, what they call it, the present moment's a flow state. You're not in your head. The point is, is you're in your heart. That's right. And that's what I think is interesting is, is why is it so hard for people to be present? Is there's this disconnect for a lot of people of what it feels to actually be in their heart. That's because of the imitation. Right. See, remember, uh, imit remember, the brain, you know, you got a right and left brain, don't you? Huh? That's two dimensional. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. That's all about polarities. And so the brain, okay, it wants control, man. Let me tell you, the brain wants to control and it controls through thoughts. And I call it thoughting. We're doing too much thoughting. In other words, we're living our life through thoughts, okay, instead of through the heart, which is the feeling life. And the feeling life doesn't necessarily have to be erratic or, 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 you know, chaotic or crazy. The thinking life is based on the human heart and the human heart is very, very organized and very, very special and so forth and so on, because it has to do with the blood and the blood is where is our emotional life. We are our blood. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, we're not our brains, we're not our feet, we're not our toes. Listen, when we, when you enter the world, when you enter into the, uh, you know, into the placentia, or when you enter into the mother, okay, okay, the, the that choice, that particular action that that's happened is can be conscious, okay. And one of the ways that you can go back and think of, well, how could I possibly make that time conscious? Well, I can't go back, whatever, because I don't have a memory. What can I do? You can look at your name. That's the first thing you can look at. Is there something to do with your incarnation when you came here that's connected to your name? Okay. Another thing you can look at is you can look at your parents. What were they good at? What was it that was outstanding about your parents not, un, not, not not the part that isn't, but the part that's really understanding, that's really out, just great about your parents, is what you came for. And so it's the first indication of what's your name and what your parents like, that you can actually connect with the past. But see, that past is a memory. That's, re, that's, that's more of rediscovering what the memory holds. And that's the trouble, is that we don't rediscover what's in the memory and that's because when we get to the point where we're at intuition we have to go back to memory and see well wait a minute did i imitate that or wait a minute is that imitation uh, is that innovation or was i inspired 
Mm. So it's a circle that we have to constantly do in our minds, okay, and in our hearts and in our actions, because those three are the foundation of the human being. Thinking, feeling, and action. Right. And it's, it appears that today a lot of people are either one or multiple points of that lacking. Um, one of them, I think, is action. I think action seems to be one that seems to be far-fetched for people or it seems too, uh, too timid or scary to start taking that. And uh, I have my opinions, but would, is there anything that you want to maybe add to it as to why? Why what? Why people aren't? Well, why people are not into are, action? Yeah, action, even potentially their feeling okay. or thinking. Okay. The reason that they don't go into action, okay, is because of the brain. The brain is telling them, hey, wait a minute now, you can't do that. Who are you? You haven't been, you know, you're not an authority. You you don't know anything. Who do you think? Who do you think you are? Okay. Mm -hmm. It's all based on an authority figure. It's based on textbooks it's based on the teachers it's based on all this kind of stuff that we have to go through as we're growing up that hurts us from actually acting we're afraid to act because mm -hmm. we might make a mistake and we get punished for mistakes okay mm -hmm. but what you have to do is you've got to get past this part of this imitation and authority there's nothing wrong with authority if it's correct or if it's true to you okay mm -hmm. And I think that the act, I think you're right. I think the action is the hardest part. And the reason uh, that, that most things don't act is because of too much thinking. Yeah. I mean, if you look at any single person who's um, done any sort of extreme sports is a big one, but any sort of things that kind of seem uh, unsafe, let's just say people go, how do you do that? And they go, I can't think like I can't allow myself to think I just need to be in what I'm doing um and that's something you hear all the time and what but it's also interesting is as you see it in uh in messages and and taglines for big corporations like Nike for example says just do it like don't they're not saying just think it you know just take act just take the action so as much as there's nefarious things with big corporations like there is truths to these things because they're saying like just there being like hey go Go be in it. Go experience it. Now, you could take it any which way you want, but if you want to look at the bright side of things, there is a lot of things to just being able to be in your body, like you said, be in your heart and just feel feel what it is that you're doing and trust that your body will take care of it. I see it all the time in my training world is when people are less in their head about the, act, the actions that they're trying to do and more in just being in their body, they accomplish what it is that they set out to do and sometimes more and then they look at me or people i know and be like how did i i just did that i did that and you're like you did do that Ex exactly you had it's it the potential is there the capability is there what was different this time and people go i don't know i think i just I, I actually i didn't think i didn't think anything i just did it and you're like exactly you allowed well, that's right what you're saying is exactly right and the one of the things that you have to realize is that when you take action, you're going to fail. Mm -hmm. And you're going to fail. I, I failed maybe two, three hundred times before I found the chest of you. I okay. never gave up. But the failure part, I learned every single time I failed, I learned something. OK, exactly. Sometimes I didn't, but most of the time I did. So most important about action is not to be afraid to fail. Right. And not to be afraid of your failure and it's, uh, other people's attitude towards your failure, because it's going to be negative. I started when I started the Chester Heat and I first started, I, I, I don't know if I told you that before, but I had a friend come over and he said, what is that over there in the corner? I says, well, I'm working on a seven sided form. And he looked at it, he says, you are? He says, that's what you've come up with? I said, yep, yeah, so far. And he says, if I got to that point, I would have quit. Mm -hmm. I didn't quit. That's the last thing I did was quit. Right. But he would have, he would have quit. And he was an artist. Isn't that interesting? And what's and what I think it is is, and this does go back into kind of intuition and and dealing with more than just the thought mind in that brain is going when you're somebody who's on a path where something intuitively feels right you know, similar to you, like, I'm not going to stop. 
it's the reason why I'm not where I am is, and I use, people use the word failure and I get it. And, but for me, it's taking it and just rewarding it because so many people being that we're thought people as we hear the word failure and it, it creates a response in the brain of going fail, you know, mis, you know, uh, terrible, miserable, you know, nothing. I'm worth, you know, like they come up with all these words where I just look at it now going, when I intuitively know that I'm onto something, all those failures are just purely obstacles that are in the way before I get to where I need to go. That's all. It's just an obstacle. Okay, cool. That wasn't what I thought it was. All right. I just reached an obstacle. What do I do? Well, I can climb over it. I can sit and I can observe it kind of like, cause I do rock climbing. I can look at the wall and see how I'm going to get over through this obstacle. I can just kind of be present with that, not try to force anything or, you know, or I can go around it. You know what I mean? Like there's ways to look at these obstacles and this, what you're saying is going like, I don't fail. It's like, yeah, I just, I don't let obstacles try to stop me from getting to where I'm going. And that's all it is. And when I've said that to people, like, especially with my clients, they go, I guess I never thought of it that way. And I go, isn't that crazy how spells, spelling, you know, word, word magic can have such a hold on people. Well, you mentioned obstacle, which is really, uh, really an important word. And the reason is why that's so important is because the earth Okay, and the experience we have here on Earth is all about obstacles. Mm -hmm. And obstacles are, again, the same thing I keep talking about is these polarities, which is hurting the heart. Okay, you get stuck on one side. Okay, right. now, all, all barriers, all barriers are there to help you. I agree. I agree with you 100%. They're for there. They're there to help you. They're not to discourage you. No. The only thing that discourages you are others. And you don't need others if you're dealing with barriers because they're your barrier. Yep. Now, one of the really good ways that can show that is that what, okay, we all come to the earth, okay, because we have a problem. And that problem we're here to solve. Okay. Yep. Now that's a philosophy. Okay. We can believe it or not. But for instance, if you have some trouble with an organ, okay, what you need to do is to study that organ that you're having trouble with. It's a liver or a kidney or whatever. And you have that problem that the doctor has prescribed. What you have to do is to study that organ and find out what it is that that organ does, okay, that it's not doing that's preventing you, okay, from going through it. So the obstacles there, this, the obstacle that you have, either physically or mentally or the action, whatever, is your gift. That's the gift that you were given when you entered this earth. That's the gift that helps you decide how and what you can do about your problem that you came here to solve. That's, I love that. I, I couldn't agree more with that. And as you said, it takes a sense of getting into more of spiritual understanding and knowing that we're more than just this vessel. Like this is just a piece of us. There is something bigger and that we have a bigger purpose here. And this is something that I've been now kind of preaching and harping for a while is knowing like when I look at you, when I look at myself, when I look at everything around, it's like, this was here for a reason. It's here for a reason. This interaction right. is here for a reason. What is there to be learned? What, as you said, what obstacle can I embrace rather than face? You know, and that's the thing that I like to look at is going, you know, really, I, I kind of steal it from a guy named Jocko Willing is when there are obstacles, doing my best to not get into the polarity, but just going good. All right, obstacle good, great. What can I learn from this? And don't get me wrong, when you're, when you're in it, it's hard. I, I would be lying if I said it's not hard at times, but going back in moments or allowing yourself to breathe, right? Take a deep breath, as we always talk about, and go, what is there to be learned here? And there's always going to be something. There's never a moment where there's not a learning opportunity. It's when, and I couldn't agree more, and it stopped me if I'm speaking out of line here, but it is when we get too much in our head, we don't allow ourselves to learn because you know we're going back to um, imitating. And if we're imitating these polarities, it, it, you're, you're, you're just limiting the, the who you are. You're limiting your potential. You are. You're on your way to, to say what you just said, you're on your way. 
And once you get on a way, once you get inspired, what you are, okay, you can't stop. No. It's addictive. I mean. It really is. Oh, boy. Your life really changes when this happens. You're lucky it happens when you're young. Yeah. Well, I, I, I guess for me, what, for you, what's, the, when you say the addiction part, because I can speak for myself, but what is it that's so addictive to you on this journey? Because I think a lot of people can't fathom at this point or want to know kind of where we are in that just holistic mindset and body space right now. But I guess, what does that addictiveness mean to you? Like, how does that guess manifest itself in your reality? Well, uh, I guess the, what really helped all that start in, in humanity, I think is a development of the computer and to realize that it's, it's, um, has its limits, but it does have its potential mm -hmm. that you can have a podcast and you can reach lots of people, which you couldn't do that before. Right. Okay. But also there's a negative side of it. Remember, it's just all about polarities. Yeah. It's the bad side of, of the computer and social media and, of course. and and whatever these, you know, these billionaires are doing now that right. started the whole thing. Right. But remember that computer and and all of us that we're experiencing right now, it's good for us. We need this. We need this as a barrier. This is the war that we need to solve. And that war between ideas is in us. Mm -hmm. The war is in us. It's not outside us. It's in us. Totally. I could, I, that I could not agree more. And that's where I've I actually wrestled for a while is going like, I need to, I want to just be off all social media. It's like, I want to not do all this stuff. This is before I even did the podcast. And I realized knowing that, okay, yeah, it could be used for nefarious reasons. It could take you in places that kind of deter you from your purpose and path in life, but it can also guide you. And as you just said, those deterring is part of your journey. It's part of embracing that failure obstacle, but it's, it's giving yourself the opportunity to go through that, to know that that's what's happening. And therefore, if I'm using these platforms that we can look at all the negative side, it's like, but that's. It's, it's necessary. I needed that in order to, for me at least, go, can I then send, use this platform to create a positive message? Can I use this platform to get people at least thinking? Maybe we're wrong about some things. Maybe I'm bringing things up that people are like, hey, that's not right. And as you say, cool, okay, I failed. Great, awesome. Let's learn from that. But at least it's hopefully through the process getting people to go, hey, I never thought of it that way. Or, hey, you know what? That got me thinking. And now what we've done is we've created a space on these places where people can go, man, I, I feel like I can really connect with people. You know, I feel like I can really engage or get my mind going and rather than just aimlessly scrolling or feeling like everything's despair driven. It's like, you know, if we can do, if I can be a part of that, then I'm like, great. This is awesome. This is, this is part of that addictiveness because now I get to talk to people like yourself where you're bringing things to my mind. And then for three, four weeks now, I'll be playing with my son and I look at something different and I go light bulb intuitively something's going on. What is it? Why is my mind going? What connecting pieces do I have here? Oh, wow. You know what I mean? And before you know it, it's just like, I'm so in the moment with watching what he's doing, or I'm so in the moment with what I'm doing or what I'm watching, observing, listening to. And I just go, this is what it's all about. This is what it is. And obviously you can't tell somebody that they have to experience it themselves, but these conversations this addictiveness that people, I guess, you know, and I know people who've reached out to me, they go, I love the energy that you guys have. You really seem like you're enjoying the conversation and it's because it's true. And people feel that energy or that prana or that whatever we want to call it. And uh, I just want to hopefully, you know, through this addictiveness that I have and what you have through this, this medium, be able to get people to go, Hey man, I want, I want to be on that wavelength or I want to be in that prana too, you know, cause it's fun. It's, exciting it makes you it's just said it, there is no dull moment i've i've learned there's no dull moment in life so well well one thing i want to tell you about the computer is that and what you're saying is the computer is based on one and zero mm -hmm. okay that's two-dimensional totally Those are polarities so what do you bring to this you bring the third dimension yep, yep, you yep. bring root three you, you bring, bring root three there it is it's, it takes care of my whole my whole i was gonna say 
that that's going to be like your little thing root three coming at that root three there but it's so true though and that's and that's the more we talk it just all these light bulbs are going off in my head being like yes yes of course that makes intuitively feels right instead of that you know I can think about it and it makes sense. It's going, I f it really does feel intuitively right. And that's what's such a powerful thing about uh, what we're doing here. And I love that, yeah. So here's your root three, go back to root three. Okay, right. so let me tell you something about root three. Let's talk. <laughs> it's the number you can multiply itself to get three square miles, okay? Three square miles, you said? Yeah, in other <laughs> words, three square, Okay, if two times two is four, mm -hmm. I mean, is is two times two is is yeah is four, that's four square miles. But what number times another number makes three square miles? Is it really? That's one question, and that question answered by root three. Hmm. This times itself makes three square miles. Now, the distance from here to here is perfect in a cube. Wow. So we take this to the mathematician, okay? And he comes up with 1.3, no, 1.7320. At the end of the number of root three, they are still trying to find. It's okay. gone over 2 million already. It goes, it goes uh, uh, 1.7324401001 and then, 20 zeros and one comes up. Oh my God, then one, then there's a zero, zero, zero and then a six comes up. It never ends. The mathematicians have never found the end of the number times itself makes three square miles. Put it in the cube, it's perfect. Wow. Put it in the Vesica, which I showed yesterday, which you knew, you know what the Vesica is. Yeah, yeah. This right here is root three. I just produced it. The mathematicians can't find the end. Wow. There it is, right there. And that's the middle between two polarities and exactly the balance. The same distance from here is from here to here. And the same distance from here to here is from here to here. Can, can, can you lift it up so we can see? Just so you oh, can see sorry. people. That's all right. So the same distance from where to where to start? Okay. The distance from the outside of this circle Mm -hmm. to the center okay is one the mm -hmm. distance from the center to the center of the other one is one and the distance from the center of this one to the outside is one so this is one 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 this is exactly in the middle between two polarity and this is the heart is constructed on root three so this is two-dimensional okay this is three-dimensional see how they relate yep they are connected so there is a between the zero and the one in computers. There's going to be a root three. Wow, that's mind blowing. That's a beautiful thing right there, and that's it. It makes and that's the thing when you're 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 not just saying this subjectively, as you said. You are allowing the sacred geometry, the geometry, to be expressed. You're just discovering, and then you're just showing you everyone what it is that the geometry has shown you. And that yeah. for me is so powerful. Well, nobody has the seven. No one's ever had the seven. No one ever found this. Okay. So I have all new things to discover about this. That's blowing a lot of people's minds, especially the, the scientists and the and the mathematicians. Okay. And most of most of them ignore it because it's it's too subjective. You know, it's not objective enough. And, and then the artist is saying, oh, it's way too. Uh, it's way too mathematical, it's too objective, it's not expressive. And what? So right. we'll go back and forth and back and forth. Okay, this is in the middle now. <laughs> right. Right. The heart. This yeah. is the heart. It's so wild. Great, it's, isn't it? That's, and I love it. And I love it. And, and so maybe we can, because there's so many great things we can keep going on about this. But there was one question that someone had in regards to dealing with uh, talking about blood pressure. And I know we talked a little bit earlier about blood pressure and obviously the vortexes that are occurring and it's creating this suction. But maybe what we can do is, uh, if you don't mind, just exploring and explaining rather kind of what blood pressure might be meaning to you and what we're dealing with the mainstream, you know, science about blood pressure. Because the question ultimately was, is there a way to handle that without necessarily taking pharmaceuticals? Um, this is someone who's curious about it. 
Um, but I thought maybe exploring a little bit more of what may be causing these quote unquote blockages um, and then kind of getting your, your, your advice and input on that. Well, I, you know, I always have to say that, uh, you know, I'm not a doctor. It's not right. my interest. Um, my interest is uh, form and, and its development and how, what's behind the form. Yeah. Form has a function and function has a form. That's where I'm at. Okay. okay. So first off, um, <clears throat> there's only a pulse in arteries. There's no pulse in veins. Right. Okay. So there are veins. You, you never see a person checking whether a person is dead on the road in an automobile accident. They're always trying to find an artery, aren't they? They're always going like this, or you know what I mean, or they're going like this, or you know what I mean. Yep. Okay. So if most of the things that you see in your in your in your arms or legs, whatever out the body are these blue veins. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they're only blue because of the way the light affects uh, through the skin to the blood. But you cut a a blue vein, and it's all blood, red blood. So there is no such thing as blue blood. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So, but there's no pulse in the blue, none. So there's only pressure that's coming from the red, and the red is based on vortexes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so what happens is that the blood is moving back and forth like this in the artery all the time. Okay. This doesn't go straight. But the blue does, it goes straight, but the, but the red goes like this, and that's where the pressure comes. And not only is that the vortex in, are interrelating with each other as it goes through, but also there's these little kind of valves, and that they, they're kind of like a diode. They only can go in one direction. So once it gets in there, it can't go back. And then it's pushed forward, and then it can't go back. And then it's pushed forward, and it can't go. That's where the pressure comes from. Interesting. So, and again, because then what what we've kind of learned in the mainstream mindset is that, you know, what you're seeing is these plaque buildups, blockages um, that may be causing that pressure to be, you know, higher. And one thing that I know Tom, uh, Dr. Tom, uh, Tom Cowan brought up, and I know you've spoken with him, is that, you know, what you're dealing with is that when you get that pressure buildup of plaque, it's more because it's trying to, again, get more more it's creating plaque in order to allow that pressure to maintain or trying to keep that blood you know moving pumping or whatever people want to call it at this moment so um you know kind of redirecting people's minds of knowing that that plaque built up necessarily is more beneficial it's trying to help whatever systematically is defaulting i guess you can say or it's it's lacking that it's lacking that that purpose, I guess. I, I want to keep saying charge, but you know, I feel with our conversation, you, it's more than just charge. So, you know, it's it as you said, is it's coming into the heart and out of the heart at the same rate. It's now getting to a point. Obviously, it's going through the body, trying to you know spread that oxygen and blood to the rest of the body. It's it, if it's going in this this pulse or this pressure wave here, back and forth. You know, I guess my question is, you know, and thinking about it for this person who reached out is with that plaque buildup, right? What's causing that plaque buildup? Why is your body creating this response? Um, so I don't know if maybe there's some thoughts that maybe, I know not your opinion, but maybe some thoughts that you have on this. Um. Well, uh, this is coming from a, you know, non-doctor, it's just coming from me. Uh, I think most of the problems that you're having with the blood and the veins and the arteries and the heart is based on food. It's eating the wrong kind of food. Okay, so there's this opinion I have. Okay, so what I don't have, I have more of a, a, an objective view of the heart is that I know the shape the heart takes when it goes into congestive heart failure. Let's talk about that, yep. All right, so congestive heart failure, as far as the cardiologists are concerned, it's the, the heart is, is in a healthy state, looks like a football, and when it's congestive heart failure, it looks like a basketball. Mm -hmm. I'm just not satisfied with that. I mean, I don't know <laughs> why they are. Uh, <clears throat> the thing is, is that a football has two, 
it has two pointed ends. So it means it has two, um, you know, it, it's, it's the apex, okay, is only one apex in the heart, not two. There's right. not two points. Yeah. Okay, so that's ridiculous. What they're trying to do is to try to find the original shape of the heart, and they don't know what it is. I know what it is, but they don't. And now, of course, so whether to accept my explanation of, of a healthy heart in this design, I don't know. But it is the best they've got. So all they do is take a, um, and they put a net around what they think is a healthy heart. And then they put that net into a computer and they figure, oh, that's, that's the healthy heart. It's not. Most of the doctors that deal with the heart are dealing with hearts that are damaged. There's something wrong with them, not healthy. They don't operate on a healthy heart. So they don't know. Okay. The next thing is that when the heart goes from the seven into congestive heart failure, it loses one of its faces. Think of it. It goes from seven to six. Yep. And you Can demonstrate you that. that? You it goes from seven to six. Yeah, and you've been able to demonstrate that in some of your lectures. And I do. You no, I, 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 you're right. I have the geometry and the angles at four stages that shows you exactly where the heart is going into congestive heart failure and that the doctors would be able to look at these angles and be able to see it before it happens. So I don't know why they don't look at my stuff. And they could see that the heart, where, where does one of the, okay, where does one of the faces get lost right how can wh which one of the seven becomes out of the picture and then all there's left is six yeah that's now, geometry yeah now do you real quick because now my, my mind's going now do you have an awareness or any knowledge on what what side of your chestahedron usually is where we're losing a face of course is it on what side is it? is it on the ventricle side the left ventricle side oh no no yes it is it's on the left it's on the left ventricle absolutely interesting see, so the right the right ventricle is kind of like a napkin wrapped around this big husky muscle yep yep and they cut that off falls on the ground and all they do is concentrate on this one and that's right they should concentrate this is where the congestive heart failure has its problem is in the left ventricle hmm. so this is where my mind goes to so as you said, what's going on in the left ventricle is we have blood coming in, oxygenated blood that's ready to go and then send its way up throughout the body. That's where all that, and that's also specifically where we're seeing those two vortexes occurring. That's right. When we're losing a side, let me ask you, is what have you seen or looked into or found that there's just a weaker vortex that's occurring? Or is it just, I mean, I guess, the, yeah, I don't know if I'm making, but have you noticed anything that specific when you're seeing that congestive heart failure or losing a side? Like in regards to the vortex or the way the blood's pumping through that ventricle? Or yeah, that's I, I, I go, to answer that question, I go back to geometry, not me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, if you just hold for a minute, I'll give you, I'll show you the geometry of how congestive heart failure. Let's get yeah works let's take let's take two minutes here and we'll okay. uh, yeah all right we are back in all right we just had to take a quick minute break here uh yeah. while we found what we needed so i'm gonna let frank take the take the mic well i've i've found basically what happens as uh the um congestive heart failure that takes place has a geometry background it has a, a geometry uh, explanation um which is interesting so um, the, as before, I showed you, this is the shape of the left ventricle, you know, healthy shape. This is the shape that uh, doctors uh, are trying to find, uh, the healthy shape. Right. right. This has seven sides, okay? That's the only reason they've never found it, because the seven hasn't been around. Right. Okay. So what happens is that inside the heart, this you have to imagine is the space inside the heart that the blood takes and this as uh, i showed you before you you know how it does this yep so if you look at the top okay it really it really twists a lot let's see if i can show that 
There's a lot of twisting going on. Yep. Look at that twisting. See it? Right. Yep. And that would be in relation, so people know that'd be the top of the more the top of the heart near the aortic arc. Yeah. Yeah. This this is the one I showed yep. before. Um, of course, this is the micro valve. Okay. And the aortic valve is right next to it. So, right. but but the ventricle basically does this this twisting. See that twisting? A lot yep. of all right, what happens in congestive heart failure is that the heart starts to grow and get larger, like they say, a basketball. Right. Okay. That's all they know. Okay, so actually what's happening is the heart is becoming spherical, like this is spherical, but mm -hmm. they don't realize this is a cube. Yeah. This is a cube, and this is a minimum surface cubes, not just me guessing. This is the shape that the congestive heart failure takes, okay, but it's also beating and so forth, so it, it isn't so clear as, as a model. Right. right. So inside, inside, this is the normal human heart, you know, the healthy mm -hmm. heart. This is what happens in the congestive heart failure, is that these triangles grow. Let's see if I can put the other one back up. See the yep. difference. Yep. You see now, how bigger the triangle is? And now that's in, in relation to the, the, the heart becoming more cubed. Yeah, this is becoming more cubed. Got it. Got and it. So inside, inside the congestive heart failure, these triangles are large and this can't move very much. Look. Yep. So what's happened is it can't pump as much blood. Right. It gets so big. Okay. Then it's just, 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 just like that. And so it's struggling, okay, and it fails. And the mm -hmm. reason is, is because the inside cannot move as much blood as a healthy heart. Right. And that's what happens, okay, with all the, you know, plaque buildup and so forth and so on. It's all connected to this. So the thing is, is that if the doctors looked at this, if the cardiologists will look at this, this is exactly what happens. And I know this, I know the shape, okay, between the chestahedron and this shape. The chestahedron, of course, looks like this and then on surfaces. So I know how this shape turns into this shape. I know, and I know it in four different stages. So the doctors could be able to study these shapes and these angles and then know more about how to start working on the congestive heart failure. Yeah. Absolutely. Shouldn't we be doing this? Yeah. Shouldn't we be looking at these things? Well, just why aren't we just even looking at these things to find out if they're wrong? Because that's what they like to do is to find all faults. So come on, let's find yeah. the faults here. I agree. And this is and this is the scary thing. And and I said this in the first one. Um, and I'm gonna say it again. It's not gonna be coming from those people because we know more often than not what's gonna happen is the ones who do speak out, who have spoken out, they get chastised, they get kicked out of the club, they don't get to be a part of the crew anymore. Well right. it's because, right? It's because you're bringing something that's not going to just have people cope with their pains and their ailments, you're going to really help people be on top of their own life. And that's where it goes into what I said last time. And I'll say again, is that this is these platforms and trying to have these conversations and just people spreading the word and just hearing people being like, I look more into Frank. I look more into what you're, you guys were talking about. That's how it's going to get across because people are then going to go potentially to the doctor and go, do you know about this? I want you to tell me about this. And they're going to go, uh, what? You know what I mean? Or they're going to go, damn it. Okay. You know, and, and, and I don't mean that in a destructive way to you, but it's going to have to make people respond. There's going to be no other option. And this is why having our voices in these conversations, you know, loud and clear is like, Hey, we're, we're here to help. We're here to give you this understanding of who you are, what is going on in your own body, because that's the scariest people right now. And with obviously all the pandemonium that's out there at the moment and call it what you want but you know a little silliness in my opinion it's going i don't even know what's going on in my own body what is this thing okay i need to have more awareness of this and it's going great cool now you're ready to receive this information um so and i'm with you but it's gonna it's gonna fall on the people it's gonna fall on people 
taking action in their own life. And it's not going to be the, you know, not to disrespect, but it's not going to be necessarily the doctors having to learn this. It's the people. Because if the people are coming in, just like you see when people go to doctors and they go, hey, that thing I told you, you weren't going to be able to cure or heal. It's better. What did you do? And then they go, oh, I took it into my own hands. And they go, hmm, interesting. <laughs> you know, and, and so that's where I think it could be really powerful. So one thing that I'm always trying to do, right, is bring up questions. And maybe I can bring this question to you. And kind of what we were saying earlier is like, okay, well, if we're kind of creating this congestive heart failure where we're losing form, but we know that the body is a perfect design and it has the capacity to find itself back to its pure form, what can we do? What needs to take place, right? And you brought up food. You brought up, and I also, and I would throw in there water. Um, I think they kind of go hand in hand, but I also would bring in, like I said, talking about movement in the sun and connecting with sun and not just moving through all these pieces, but going to what you said about the heart is doing it from a heart space feeling. And the reason why I say that is because if we're eating foods that maybe are deficient in, in some new nutrients or whatever, how are we, are we appreciative? Are we grateful for that meal? Are we appreciative of grateful for our water? Are we appreciable, appreciative and grateful for the sun connecting with nature? Or do we have this, 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 as you said earlier, this barrier, this obstacle with it? because that plays a role. Just like they say, you know, and they've shown like, you can eat something that's uh, maybe not the best food for you. It has, you know, some stuff in there that maybe wouldn't be natural to the body, but it was made by your mom. It was made by your grandma that the love was behind the meal and you felt that love and you connected with it. And when you eat it, you don't feel shame. You don't feel guilt. You don't feel blah. You feel love. And so it's these types of things that I bring to the table of going, well, we can get into the science about it being lack of, def, you know, deficient in certain vitamins and minerals and why you're not getting enough hydrogen in the body. And, and these are all important, but anyway, you get where I'm going with it. Anything you want to add to that? Well, I'll just add on to what other people should be adding on to it. Okay. Because what you're doing is you're giving away. All right. And it's very important to give it away. You know, the Chester Hayden was never patented. I never patented it. I gave it away to the world. I gave them how to, how to draw it, how to measure it, everything. I gave it away. And I'm just like I'm now giving you away in your audience my work. I'm giving it away. So therefore, when that happens, when you do give away what you're doing, more comes. Yep. And the reason it comes yep. is because you're emptying. Yeah, you're not all full. There's a story about this Zen master and this guy who wanted to become a monk. And he went to the Zen master and he said, look, I want to become a monk. And the guy says, uh, OK, the, 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 the priest or whoever, the, the uh, <clears throat> rabbi or the, uh, the, the Zen master said, OK, would you like some tea? He said, sure, I'd like to have some tea. And said, OK, so he puts out the, the teacup and the and the tea and he starts pouring the the uh tea into the the, the, the guy that wants to be a a zen monk also and it, he fills it up it's going all over he says stop stop outside there's enough already you're, you're, you're spilling the tea all over the floor and the zen priest says well that's like you and he says what do you mean that's like me he says you're full there's nothing else can go in Mm -hmm. that's what we have to do we have to empty ourselves all the time of what we've done and who we think we are and all this other stuff that we get involved with the ego okay and let that go and give it away so more can come in absolutely i love that and it and that hit that resonates like goosebumps because that's the hardest thing i think for a lot of us and my and i'll speak for myself rather is that you get caught up in this mind and that ego has, and in my opinion, has such a, a strong connection with that mind is because then it's, you know, as you said, how are people viewing me? What's, you know, how in the past was I, you know, perceived in this? How can, how can I make myself look different or appear different to be liked or appreciated or loved and realizing you're not in that feeling space, the heart space where you said you're opening yourself up and just going like, 
I, I'm just going to get, I'm, let me give, let me give to much as I can. And that really, we hear all these stories, like similar to what you just shared and we hear it, but we don't understand it. We can't grasp it. And I think that's what's so beautiful when you can get to that place and continue to be on that journey, because there's always something new to learn. There's always something new to take away as we've said many times here. But what's great about, I, I think now for me, at least the people that I've listened to and I talk to and people who listen are a little more in that space of going, I need to just give up this idea of who I am and not to be like, oh, forget it. It's going, how can I just give? How can I just be a be a part of this system of nature and, and this beautiful creation and not be a hoarder? And it's always for me, like, that's how you get that you <laughs> said. It comes full, it comes, like you said, in an abundance when you just go, let me just give, like, I know people are like, dude, you have all these training methods. Like, why are you just giving it out to the world? And I go, because it's not me. I'm just, I'm just one person who has come and stumbled upon this stuff. Right. And I found benefit from it. I want other people to have it. I don't need, you know, if, if they choose to work with me and there's an exchange of, you know, currency, okay, fine. But that's, more at the end of the day, it's about knowing, hey, did someone benefit from these things that are brought to the table? And if I was wrong about something, did, was I able to go find that answer through talking to people like yourself or um, reading into it and then asking questions? Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's what it's such a beautiful thing. I love this. I love this. But well, just, rem just, just rem remember what the most, the biggest ego people are the ones that think they know more and that's they've memorized more and therefore they're more uh, prone to think that they're a big shot because the brain tells them that they know more and it's not it's not about how much you know it's really not how much you know it's how much you can feel your thinking is correct and true what you're looking for is truth and the truth is found in the heart not in the mind absolutely absolutely and i love every bit of that um well what is there anything i know we kind of went on some beautiful tangents and i brought some ideas to your 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 field but is there anything that you specifically that maybe you wanted to get across some ideas concepts of things you've worked on because i know you've done so many things and we could talk for hours <laughs> yeah. and we haven't even got into the four elements and the geometric patterns and shapes of those um but is there is there anything that uh, you wanted to kind of wrap things up with because we could always come back and talk more about it i mean I, I know there's so much amazing stuff in this conversation already that i know i've taken away from but um any lasting things before we kind of wrap up i uh, just just you know keep your feet on the ground and keep your your head in the clouds and in between is the answer i love that uh, that's a great way to end it well thank you so much frank You're where can well. people find you where's the best place to catch people I'll catch you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Good luck. Thank you so much. Well, thanks. And yeah, we'll talk to you soon. Bye, guys. Bye.